Good evening, everyone. Welcome to all. I've signed on it early, as I always do, just so I can have a good chat before we start our tour and show you this lovely crowd that I found, which I think encapsulates what I'm going to be talking about tonight quite nicely. I hope you're all well and warm. Hello, Sue. Good evening to you. It's not warm here, unfortunately. It's freezing cold. I think it's minus one outside. That's cold for England. Hello, Janice. Hello, Carrie. Good evening to you. And welcome to everyone that's joining us. My messages take a little time to pop up on my screen. So even though there are people joining us, they're not showing up on my screen yet. So don't be offended that I haven't mentioned you. I will soon. Like Emma. Good evening, Emma. Welcome to you. I've just signed on nice and early just to make sure that everyone can find me and everyone can log on and find out where I am. Hello, Dawn. Good evening to you. And hello, Trisha. I hope you're all good and well. It's rather cold outside, which is why I'm not outside. You see, I'm smart, I am. Hello. Welcome, everyone. As you can see, I'm in the comfort and security of my own home because it's far too cold outside to be venturing around, although I will be doing that later, but only when I'm completely immolated in, in different layers of clothing, just to keep me nice and warm. So good evening to everyone that's joining us. I think I might need my glasses here. Oh, is that better or worse? Oh yes, it is if I sit here. Hello, Claire. Good evening to you. And hello, Amanda. Welcome everyone that's joining us. I just logged on a little bit early just to make sure that everything's working okay. And uh, we'll start in about 10 minutes time. Oh, lighting effect. <laughs> And I hope you're all well. I hope you're all not too freezing cold. I think it's the uh, the weather forecast in Europe is pretty grim at the moment. Hello, Barry. Good evening to you, Barry. I hope you're keeping warm, sir. It's nasty weather out there. It's been a nice sunny day, I believe. I say I believe because I've not actually been out in it much. It's been my day off. But it also has been very cold. Which is why I'm doing this tour at home, which seems like a sensible solution. The other reason I'm doing it is because there was meant to be a tube strike this week. So the London Underground were meant to be going on strike, but at the last moment they called it off, which kind of spoiled people's plans in a different kind of way. So welcome everyone that's joining us. We've got about eight minutes to go, 10 minutes to go in fact. Ah, oh, there we are, I signed in nice and early, just to make sure. I hope you like my, uh, my quote on the screen there, from Friedrich Nietzsche. I do like to find quotes for all the virtual tours that I do. Hello Pamela, good evening to you. I hope you're well. I hope everyone is enjoying the new year. After the excitement of Christmas, it's gone back into deep, dark, dismal January. 
Oh, we should be used to it by now. It happens every year. It'll be fine, eventually. Come March, when it gets a bit warmer. Hello, Pat. Good evening to you. I'm just sitting here at home, enjoying uh, the warmth and security of my own home, rather than trekking around the streets of London in the freezing cold, although I will be doing some of that later in the month. But for now, I'm going to stay where it's nice and warm and tell you all some chilling tales, which kind of counteracts that, really. Hello, John. Good evening to you. Or good afternoon, or good morning, or good night. No, not good night. That would be strange. Whatever time it is, in whatever time zone you are. I've just signed on nice and early, as I always do. Got eight minutes to go just to make sure that people can find us. Some people have difficulty finding exactly where I'm going live. So hopefully that will get easier for people as they, once they discover the secret that I'm there on the group page, raring to go. And I am raring to go. I've not been working all day. It's been my day off. So normally I would be doing these tours having done one or two of my own, uh, of my parliamentary tours before this. But today I've, I've been at a loose end. Of course I've had things to do, but yes, it's nice to be able to, to talk to you people again. My favourite people. So we'll start in about seven minutes time. And of course, we will start on time as always. And we're talking about Bedlam Hospital. And that's, of course, where the word comes from when you say things are complete Bedlam, which they often are at Parliament. Then that's what we're referring to. It's this old asylum that's been around in various incarnations since the 12th century. Hello, Bonnie. Good evening to you. I hope you're all enjoying January, even though it's for most of us dark and cold and rather miserable. But there we go, <laughs> apart from that, I hope you're enjoying it as much as you can. And good evening, Maureen. Welcome to you. I'm just shooting the breeze for the next six minutes until we've officially started. Hello, Michaela. And as you can see, I'm in the, the warmth of my own home. So this is a virtual tour. And this is one of many tours that I developed over lockdown. So when there was really nothing else to do, which feels a bit like January, then I was doing these tours. I was doing virtual tours, which were... Uh, well received by people because they had nothing else to do apart from watch Netflix so it was it was me versus Netflix basically so that that was my my life for about a year and a half of doing these virtual tours so I decided to resurrect some of them and one of them is all about Bedlam and it's actually good that I'm doing it virtually because you couldn't in reality go round all the sites where Bedlam has been because it's moved around in its time. You couldn't visit all those sites in one day. Or you could, but you'd be knackered at the end of it. Hello, Lynn. Good evening to you. And hello, Sheila. I'm just explaining why this tour is virtual rather than out on the streets. Part of that, of course, is because I'm a complete wuss and I don't like going out in the cold. But another reason is that 
Bethlehem Hospital in its present incarnation is miles away on the other side of the river, on the south side of London. And its original place is right in the heart of London and it's moved several times since. So that's why in order to track the history of the hospital, it's best to do it in a, a virtual format. It works better. So we've got about five minutes to go, three minutes to go in fact. And we will start on time, of course, as always. Hello, Sarah. Good evening to you. Hope you're all keeping warm and dry. They say there might be snow in London, which would be very exciting. They say, some of the papers say that there's going to be nine days of heavy snowfall all around the country. I suspect that most of that will be up north. They always get the worst weather. We get the best in the south. But I'd quite like it to, if it snowed. I'd quite like a bit of snow. The trouble is in London, it all turns to sleet very quickly and sludge and it all goes brown and horrible. Most things go brown and horrible in London after some time. So we've got a couple of minutes left. Just enough time for more people to find me and log on. I know that some people have difficulty finding where I am. I'm always on the group page. That's where I am. Now I'm seeing that people are joining us, but what I'm not seeing is comments. Hello, Gail. Good evening to you. So I always get slightly paranoid at this point and think, am I seeing people's comments or are they hiding? So I can see that you're all joining me, but if you, someone could say hello in text, of course, I wouldn't hear you otherwise. Just so that I can be reassured that I'm seeing your messages as well as uh, seeing you coming onto the tour. Hello, Jen. Good evening to you. Tell you what, I'll send myself a message. Here we go. Ah, there we go. If it works for me, I'm sure it works for other people as well. Hello, Dennis Mustafa. Good evening to you. I'm just sending a message to myself, which might seem a slightly strange thing to do, but given the topic of our talk tonight, Doing slightly strange things is pretty much par for the course. And good evening, Michelle. Welcome to you. We've got a minute to go now before we start. And of course, we will start on time as always. Now, if someone could send me a text message, a message on here saying, hello, hi, how are you? That kind of thing. Just so that I know that everything is working. Hello, Michael. <clears throat> Good evening to you. Right, well, it is 7.30, but I am quite keen to find out whether my, uh, whether my messages on here are being seen or whether I'm seeing your messages. Hello. Good evening. So I'm still waiting. I'm hoping that someone will send me a message. It doesn't have to be a long message. Hi would do. Just to let me know that I'm seeing your messages as well. I'm seeing you coming into the room, but you all seem to be remarkably quiet and maybe that's just because you're remarkably quiet. But I'd like to know for sure one way or the other. 
Hello, Wendy. Good evening to you. Forty-two. We've got the meaning of life, the universe and everything. We've got 42 people. So while I'm waiting for someone to send me a message, as I'm sure someone will, I hope. Good evening to all of you. Welcome. My name's Nick. And if you haven't done these tours before, this is what you call a virtual tour. And that's because it's cold outside. And I don't want to get cold. That's because I'm a wuss. But also because the topic that we're talking about tonight is one that means that we can do it best by showing you pictures and vi visiting the sites of this ancient hospital, Bedlam. Hello, Wendy. Hello, Christine. Hello, Jonathan. Now, I'm hoping that someone... <laughs> I'm just checking my messages here. You can see the chat, I think. Hmm, interesting. I'm not actually seeing any messages from anyone, which is a bit strange. Because I like to chat to people while I'm doing this, but it doesn't seem that I can see your messages. Hmm, <clears throat> many hellos. Ah, there we are. Nick, you can't see our messages. <laughs> that would explain it. OK, <laughs> that would make sense. Now, let's see if I can see your messages on my Facebook page. Let's have a look, because that might work. Let's see if that clears up the problem. Otherwise, it's going to be a bit lonely talking away without anyone chatting. Let's see. 94 comments. <laughs> there we are. Someone can see me. OK. Right. For whatever reason, hello, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm going to have to kind of do, do this dual version. So I'm going to be looking at my phone. There we are. You see, look, I can see your messages on the phone, but I can't see them on the screen here, which is rather weird. But there we go. These things happen. Uh-huh. Swipe left to read comments. Let's try. Ah, hello, I've got it now. It seems to be working. Yay! <laughs> Welcome, everyone. You're all here. That's good. Welcome. <laughs> I, got, I got the message eventually. Don't worry, Trist, it's all fine. <laughs> hello, Mike. So good evening to you. Good evening to everyone. Now, as you can see, I'm comfortably ensconced in my own home. And that's because I don't want to go outside because it's far too cold and, and cold. It's not wet, but it's just cold. But also the thing that I'm going to be talking about tonight is a place that has changed location many times over the centuries. And so it's not a case of going to one location and showing you the size of this old uh, asylum because the asylum itself has changed in so many ways. And one of the ways it's changed is its location. So that's why I'm resurrecting one of my virtual tours. So during lockdown, I designed all these different tours on a range of subjects to keep people interested during the, the dark days of COVID. And this is one of them. So welcome, welcome to the tour. And I hope that you appreciate the uh, Quote here from Friedrich Nietzsche, a casual stroll through the lunatic asylum shows that faith does not prove anything. And I think that's quite a good indicator of the tone of this tour. So without further ado. All I can say of Bedlam is this. It is an almhouse for madmen, a showing room for whores. A sure market for lechers. We heard such a rattling of chains, drumming of doors, ranting, hallooing, sighing and rattling, that I could think of nothing but Don Cavedo's vision, where the damned broke loose and put hell in an uproar. I was at a loss 
to account for the behaviour of the generality of people who were looking at these melancholy objects, instead of the concern I think unavoidable at such a sight, a sort of mirth appeared on their countenance. The hideous roaring and the wild motions of others seemed equally entertaining to them. Nay, so shamefully inhuman were some, among whom I am sorry to say it were several of my own sex, as to endeavour to provoke the patients into rage, to make them sport. Dorothy, you've been to Bedlam, the, the latest incarnation of Bedlam, and we're going to talk about that a bit later, and it is incredible uh, experience. But this is just one of the several incarnations of Bedlam. And of course, that's where we get the word. When we say that something is complete chaos, that it's, it's out of control, we say it's utter Bedlam. And that word is all to do with the hospital, the insane asylum, the lunatic asylum that we're going to talk about tonight. Now, I'm going to use words like lunatic because those are the words they used at the time. Obviously, today they're not considered appropriate and for good reason. But I'm going to refer to the history of the asylum in the way that they would have done at the time. So that's my, my kind of get out clause. The ruins of a small bedlam in a forest down here in Sussex. So Lewis has made a, a really good point there because it wasn't just... Bedlam. Bedlam was St. Bethlehem's Hospital. That's the one that started it all. But eventually, any psychiatric institution, any lunatic, lunatic asylum, would be known as a bedlam. And the first bedlam appeared on the old London walls. So as you probably know, old Londinium, Roman London was surrounded by walls. And you can still see the remains of those walls all around the city of London, the heart of the city. And many of these walls contained either prisons or hospitals or leprosariums, places that were designed to give care for people with leprosy. So you had places like Ludgate. And again, there was a prison at Ludgate. There was an even more famous prison at Newgate, the most infamous prison of its time, where people were hanged both inside the walls and outside. Then you had somewhere like uh, Cripplegate. Now, Cripplegate is not actually to do with people having disabilities. It comes from an old Saxon word, kripple, meaning to creep. So that was the creeping gate. But then as well as that, you had Bishop's Gate. You like a good hanging. Emma, that's a different tour. We'll do that tour as well, don't worry. So you have Bishopsgate. And Bishopsgate was named after the old Roman entrance into the city where the first Bishop of London is said to have made his grand entrance. Hello, Anita. Good evening to you. So this was Bishopsgate. And Bishopsgate would be the place where the first hospital the first incarnation of Bedlam would be built. And here's what it looks like nowadays. It's a bustling, busy station, a modern station. This is Liverpool Street. And this is on the site of an older station called Bishopsgate Station. But before that station was built, there was something else here. Now, you can't see much of the history from the front. The front is this very modern building, part of the Elizabeth Line, the Crossrail development. But this is the old Bishop's Gate station, and it was knocked down in the 1990s. And around it was built a new entrance to the Elizabeth Line. Hello, Claire. Oh dear, you've had problems finding me. I do apologise. I'm glad you found me in the end. I'm always here on my group page. That's the place to go. So this was the old Bishopsgate station. And eventually they dug it up or dug underneath it 
dug through several layers of London's history. And while they were digging in the cross-rail development here at Liverpool Street, they found skeletons. As you can see, not just one skeleton, but huge numbers of skeletons. Now, many of these skeletons were from the plague, the Great Plague of 1665. And they were analysed and found to be containing plague bacteria. So it was clear that many of these skeletons were people that had died from the plague. But also there were people that had been buried in graves which were originally unmarked. And they were the ones that had died at Bedlam. So apart from the indignity of being held in this lunatic asylum, after you died, if there was no one to care for you, as often there wasn't, you could be buried out in the grounds of the asylum. Apparently, Dawn, when they dug London Underground first in the 1850s and 1860s, they did uncover many old grave sites, plague pits, things like that. They didn't mark them all down and many of the bones were taken to various other cemeteries to be reburied. But if you go round the back of Liverpool Street, <clears throat> near these old Victorian buildings, which used to be part of old Bishopsgate Station, you can find a blue plaque on the wall. And the blue plaque is pretty much the only commemoration that this was the original site of somewhere that would become incredibly infamous. This was the site of the first Bethlehem Hospital, 1247 to 1676. So for over 400 years, it stood here. One of your great, great grandfathers was buried in an unmarked grave in a poorhouse. Yes, Trace, I've heard many, many stories about workhouses or poorhouses, asylums and people being buried in unmarked graves. And that's that's really a very sad part of the story. So the original Bethlehem Hospital was built at the behest of the Pope. And the Pope was over in Jerusalem at the time, having just retaken it. So this was named in the Pope's honour and it was named after the little town of Bethlehem. So this became the St. Bethlehem's Hospital. And St. Bethlehem's Hospital was at first a charitable institution and it took on people that were ill from various ailments from around the city of London. Often people that were travellers, that were travelling on uh, pilgrimages, they would be taken in at these hospitals if they fell ill along the way. A really good exhibition about Crossrail. Yeah, I, I've not seen it myself, but I can imagine that it's Crossrail itself uncovered so much history, a bit like the HS2 project. So to start with, Bethlehem Hospital cared for those that were sick and infirm. But it gradually began to acquire a different reputation. People were put there who were not in their right mind. Lunatics, if you like. And part of that was to do was where, with where it was based. And it was on part of the city walls. And you can see this old map showing exactly where Bethlehem used to be. And it was near a place called Houndsditch, the Tenter Grounds, Houndston. That's where Hounslow comes from, by the way. So these, these ramparts, these old Roman ramparts, housed many prisons and hospitals, and this was one of them. And Bethlehem's hospital began to acquire a very a, a, a reputation as being the place to go for people that had lost their minds. They would be sent there by the local authorities. And they were known eventually as lunatics. And of course, the word lunatics comes from the power of the moon. Many people believed and some still believe that the power of the moon affects the personality to the extent that it could even drive people mad. 
that they would behave very oddly during a full moon, for example, which is again where we get the idea of lycanthropy, becoming a werewolf, that the power of the full moon could change your personality. There was a group in the 1880s, a group of gentlemen who were called, they called themselves the lunatics, and they would uh, make a study of the, the lunar surface from their telescopes in the Science Museum. But they called themselves lunatics, which was a bit of a strange thing to do. You don't sleep well when it's a new moon. Yeah, yeah, it, I, I think it does definitely have an effect on people. We know it has an effect on the tides. No, I, I agree. I used to work in social care and I could see a definite change in some people when there was a full moon. So apart from places like the Bethlehem Hospital, there were no real facilities for people with any kind of disability, especially mental disabilities, as you can see here. Here's a, a lovely medieval woodcut of someone being pushed around on a makeshift wheelchair. And it's unclear whether he's got a physical disability or a learning disability as well, possibly both. But what he's doing is being pushed around by his parent and people would give him arms, A-L-M-S, as you can see. The guy on the right side is reaching into his purse and pulling out some arms to give to the, the boy. So there was an idea that the community would help those in greater need than themselves. Hello, Elizabeth. Good evening to you. Change into a werewolf. Yes, I used to be a werewolf, but I'm all right now. Ooh! Oh, dear. The old jokes are the worst. Admit uppity women. Oh, we'll come on to that, Lynn. Don't worry. Oh, yes, we'll get there. As well as that, the idea, what's an arm? So arms was money for the poor, Tricia. The idea was that uh, if you went to church, someone would go round with a, a bowl, as they still do in many churches, and they would collect money for the poor, for those more needy than themselves. And this was known as arms. So they even built houses called arm houses, where again, poor people were allowed to stay if they had no home. But it wasn't just the care in the community aspect that wasn't great. It was also the way that they treated me mental illness at the time. And from medieval times right up until the 19th century, practices like these that you can see here would be very much in demand. So here you can see someone being bled. And the idea was that this would release bad humours in the blood. I'll explain more about humours in a moment. But this person is being bled by what they laughingly called a doctor at the time. So that was one treatment for madness. Here you can see another. This person is having their skull drilled into. And the idea again was to let out vapours or humours from the brain that were driving that person insane. It was sometimes known as trepanning and drilling a hole in the skull to release the devils, if you like. And it was pretty horrible. Exactly, Dorothy Trepanning. Now, what you can see here is that this is a picture by Bruegel, and it shows that the people performing the operation are actually just as mad as the patient, if not more so. That's why they have the strange objects on their heads. Quacks, exactly, Dorothy as they would become known in the 18th century. And finally, there was uh, another regime that was meant to cure madness, and that was ice-cold baths. And again, that would carry on way up until the 20th century with people like Dr. Kellogg, who had his own health resort and pres prescribed cold baths for the people that attended. So these were some of the rather outlandish remedies for madness at the time. And the idea was that it was all about the choleric humours or the humours in the body. And they were split into four sections, as you can see here. So it was believed that every part of the body could be 
cured and that this would also in turn cure the mind. So any disease of the mind was also meant to be seen as a disease of the body. So as you can see on the right hand side, you've got yellow bile, mm, lovely, choleric. You've got black bile, melancholic. You've got phlegm, phlegmatic, and blood, sanguine. So these were the four humours, and of course they're still used in our English language today. We talk about people me being melancholic. We talk about a phlegmatic personality, someone who's very sanguine and someone who's choleric. So these were all descriptions of people's personalities. Yeah, exactly, yeah. But part of it was, was genuine. It was the treatments that we used to cure these humours in the body that weren't so uh, effective. So this was the idea that these treatments, including drilling holes in your head, would let out some of these uh, unnecessary biles or, or humours. You might have too much of a certain humour in your body. So you might be overly choleric, in which case they would starve you or make you vomit. So these were some of the, the uh, solutions that, were, that came up. And the doctors certainly believed this at the time. This is a quote by uh, an 18th century doctor who also worked at Bedlam. Lunacy requires threatenings, bonds or strokes, as well as physic, i.e. medication. For the madmen being placed in a hole, in hole, house convenient for the business must be handled both by the physician and also by the servants that are prudent, that he may in some manner be kept in, either by warnings, chidings or punishments inflicted on him to his duty or his behaviour or manners. The treatments were worse than the punishments. Exactly. <laughs> oh, Lynn, I like that. The four humours were the original Marx Brothers. There we are. I like that. On the ball there. So this was the idea that basically you could have your madness beaten out of you. And this was the job of the doctors. But back in early medieval times, in the 14th and 15th century, Bedlam became quite important. And that's because it was the only one of its kind. And for centuries, it would remain the only dedicated lunatic asylum in the country. Because of that, it was politically important. And many people in London wrestled for control of Bedlam, including the Pope. And fair enough, because he was the one that set it up originally. So the Pope wanted control over Bedlam and control over the money that it made because patients would be admitted to Bedlam at, at a cost. And that was the same with prisons at the time. Prisons were a going concern. They were places that you paid to be in. You had to be there, of course, but you also had to pay. So the Pope wanted to retain control of Bedlam and also the king. In this case, King John also wanted a, a look in. He wanted to be in control as well because, well, you know, he was king after all. But right in the middle, there was another organisation that felt that they should have overall control of the hospitals and prisons in central London. And this was the Corporation of London. And the aldermen, the councillors of London, were very clear that they didn't want the interference of the church or royalty, that they felt they were the ones that should look after Bedlam. Were people rounded up from the streets or were they reported by lunacy for by other people? So Lois, it was a bit of both. And as we'll find out in the 18th and 19th century, it was a case of uh, people being wrongly admitted to these asylums for various financial reasons. <laughs> Why is there an E at the end of Bedlam? There's no final E on Bedlam. 
<laughs> That's true, exactly. <laughs> I think it's it's the, the medieval people at the time, you know, they, they wrote in a strange way. That's why Shakespeare had about 30 different versions of his name. He could never quite decide which one he wanted. And it was the same with medieval writing at the time. So basically what I'm trying to do is say, I don't know. <laughs> it's those medieval writers. Exactly, just oldie English. There we are, Dawn. <laughs> There's a perfect example. Mum always said we made the house like Bedlam. Well, there we go. That's the joys of parenthood. So Bedlam became a very exclusive institution. And people, there was a waiting list, a waiting list of mad people to get into Bedlam. And those that did began to pay increasingly high rates for the privilege of going to what was the only lunatic asylum in the country. For the rest of them, the ones that couldn't pay the high rates, the, when, the ones that weren't in the right place, i.e. near London, they would be left often to wander the countryside. And they would make money, make a living the best way they could. Sometimes they would make a living by being extra mad. So if there was some problem with their mental health, they would exaggerate it. They would make themselves out to be fools, big fools, in order to take, get people's pity and that people would give them money. And these travelling lunatics, these wandering lunatics, became known as Tom Abedlams. And that became the generic term to apply to anyone who had mental health difficulties. They were all Tom Abedlams. And Shakespeare knew this well. In fact, in King Lear, he writes about it. He describes one of the sons, Edgar, the good son, the honest son, disguising himself in order to get back into King Lear's court. And he disguises himself as a lunatic. My face, I'll grime with filth, blanket my loins, and with presented madness outface the winds and persecutions of the sky. The country gives me proof and precedent of bedlam beggars who with roaring voices strike in their numbed and mortified bare arms pins, wooden pricks, nails, sprigs of rosemary. So this was Shakespeare writing about the Toma bedlams who were obviously self-harming often to try and gain people's attention as well as for the, re the other many reasons that people self-harm. But it wasn't until the reign of Henry VIII that things started to change, but not necessarily for the better. So Henry VIII decided that he would give control of Bedlam to the City of London, to the Alderman, the Corporation. And that's because he had many other interests, including chopping the heads off his wives and getting married and trying to bear a son. You know, he had a lot of go lot going on for him. So he decided that one thing he would relinquish control of was Bedlam. So he gave the hospital over to the control of the Corporation of London. Now, you might have thought that this would be a good thing, but actually it turned out rather differently. There were many of these prisons and hospitals that were given over to the Corporation of London. And some of them were, again, for specific types of people, like Bridewell. This is Bridewell Prison, also located on what was the old Roman walls of the city. And this became a place for prostitutes and also for scolds, the women that talked too much and offended their husbands, they would be sent to places like this. And each of these institutions would have a master, a jailer, a head that would look after, <laughs> or not quite look after, the prisoners. And that was true of Bedlam. The people, the councillors of London, decided to appoint a master that would have overall control. And the master was obviously someone who had some 
medical knowledge. The idea being that if it was a surgeon, they could apply the appropriate remedies. The cuttings, the bleedings, the cold baths, all of that could be done with the aid of the surgeon. So Halkiah Crook became the first master of Bedlam. And his name is quite appropriate because that's exactly what he turned out to be. Halkiah Crook was a renowned, although rather infamous, surgeon. And you can see that from the books that he wrote. This was the description of the body of man, and this got him into trouble with the church. In fact, he was excommunicated because of it, because this contained some rather, how shall I put it, risque descriptions of the time. So it's like a kind of racy version of uh, the, uh, the medical journals that were around at the time. But because it went into this great and rather explicit detail, they weren't happy with it in the church and that got him excommunicated. But it also got him a job and he became the first master of Bedlam. Oh, indeed, Dawn, it was very much used as a threat to control people. And Bedlam would rely for hundreds of years on charitable donations. So those people, those high class people, middle and upper class, they would pay their way. But all the other people in the hospital, and there were many that were admitted from the streets that were suffering from all sorts of maladies, they would have no one to pay for them. And so it became the responsibility of the general public to give them donations. And this is the donation box, the donation slot that was on the door to Bedlam. And people would walk past and in the Bible, their religious responsibility was to clothe the poor and feed, clothe the naked and feed the poor. And part of that, the seven pillars of their responsibility, one of them was to visit people in insane asylums. But of course, they couldn't actually do that. They were much too squeamish. And so what they did is walk past the box and put money in instead to salve their conscience. And also this money would supposedly be used to support the paupers in the establishment, the ones that couldn't pay. But Helkiah Crook lived up to his name and he stole the money. And eventually when the board of governors got round to sending someone round to look at the conditions in Bedlam, he found that the poor people were starving to death. And that's because Helkiah Crook had stolen their money. Ah, so there we are, Lynn. Was the donation really used for the patients? In this case, no. Helkiah Crook lived up to his reputation. He embezzled the money. And because of that, they got rid of him in 1633. And they decided, the, the aldermen of London, the city council, they decided that they needed a more robust system of management. And so they decided to employ three different people. Now, at the time, Helkiah Crook was also allowing people into the asylum to see the freaks, to watch the lunatics, to watch their strange antics, and they would pay for the privilege. So he was coining it in, hand over fist. He was getting money through donations and keeping it for himself. He was also allowing people to come into the asylum, not relatives or friends or anyone that was concerned, but people that just wanted to look at the freak show. And they were being charged as well. Exactly, Lynn. <laughs> Crook lived up to his name. So the council decided they would appoint three uh, people to take care of the asylum. And one of them was the master. But in this case, the master didn't live on the premises. So he would be living outside and he would be less kind of involved in the day to day running. Then you had this chief surgeon and the chief surgeon would also live outside the property. The only person who lived there would be the, uh, the, the apothecary, 
the one that mixed up the doses of emetics, stuff that would make you sick, all the medicines and potions that were needed. Oh, now I've just posted a, a link, by the way, for PayPal and buy me a coffee. And that's where you can tip me and show your generous support along the way. They had nothing better to do and Crook got rich. Exactly. There was no real standard of care for the patients, as we'll find out. So the council, the, the London uh, alderman, decided that this was a much better way to run establishments like Bedlam. But it led to problems because the chief surgeon at Bedlam began to develop a very good reputation and people would come to ask him for advice on their own particular problems. Often these people were rich and they would have a relative who was showing signs of madness or possibly a relative that they wanted to get rid of so they could claim their inheritance. And the best way to do that, apart from murdering them, which was always a little risky, the other way to do it was to get the services of a mad doctor. And that's what they became known as, mad doctors. And the highest of these mad doctors, the most experienced and famous, was the chief surgeon of Bedlam. And he and people like him would be called to the homes of these rich individuals and they would be paid large sums of money to take them away and have them locked up. So this became a way that the chief surgeon of Bedlam and the hospitals that would follow would make lots of money as well. Hello, Olivia. Good evening to you on your way back from work. I'm sure you'll catch some of our talk. So this was a way that the chief surgeon could earn a tidy sum in pronouncing people to be insane when they probably weren't. As you can see on the left and the right, these women were having fainting fits, probably because their corsets were too tight. But it gave them an excuse to say that this relative was mad and that they needed to be taken away for their own safety, and incidentally, could they change their will at the same time. So these became the mad doctors. Now these high-class patients, they wouldn't be taken into Bedlam. Bedlam was overflowing at the time. They would be taken to private madhouses, and these were places often that the surgeons owned, so they would buy mansions out in the country, and they would use them as private asylums. And once you were in one of these private asylums, it was very difficult to get out because you would be there at the behest of the chief surgeon. And unless the chief surgeon changed his diagnosis, you would stay there. And of course, for many people, that's exactly what they wanted their relatives to be taken away, out of sight, out of mind, confined in these rich and beautiful surroundings, but confined often for the rest of their lives. So this caused problems, this caused lots of talk, and eventually the papers got hold of these, I, these stories and they began to circulate more proof of the iniquitous abuse of private man madhouses. So people were aware that these things were going on. Oh, women were locked away for many reasons and men, and we'll find out some of those reasons a bit later. So the madhouses were making a lot of money and the chief surgeons were making a huge killing as well and they became known as quacks. In the early 18th century, the idea was that nobody trusted the medical establishment anymore because they were in it for their own gain. They were in it for financial reward or for their own ego or their own reputation. So what you can see on the right is a, a satire by a man called Thomas Rowlandson, who was one of the great satirists of the Georgian age. And it shows this 
portly, red-cheeked gentleman coming into a, a, the doctor's surgery, the chief surgeon's office, and he's saying, I wonder if you can help me. I'm, I'm sleeping well and, and I'm eating well, but I do feel a little, little strange. And the chief surgeon is saying, well, I'm sure that I can cure you of both of those ailments. I'm sure that after a few months with me, you won't be sleeping well and you won't be eating well either. So they would deliberately prescribe medications that would enhance the patient's suffering and prove their own point that this patient must be mad because otherwise they would have recovered by now. And this led to real life stories of terror, like this one by William Belcher. I have been bound and tortured in a straight waistcoat, fettered, crammed with physic from a bullock's horn and knocked down and at length declared a lunatic by a jury that never saw me. And what would make a man tear his flesh from his bones all through affected kindness in a madhouse, that premature coffin of the mind, a trade to which 17 years of the prime of my life have been sacrificed. On 8th of October 1678, I was overwhelmed with astonishment at being carried away to Hackney to take my abode with idiots and real or supposed madmen, some of them just as mad as myself. So this was one of many accounts that circled at the time. Hello, Eliza. And these accounts showed that people were being grabbed off the street by the justice that was imposed by these chief surgeons. Their word was law. They didn't have to get any sort of documentation from the courts. They could simply drag someone off and they would never be seen again. So all the while that Bedlam was growing and expanding, these private madhouses were also growing around the country and many people ended their lives in these beautiful and serene prisons at the expense of their sanity. But in 1674, there was a change and the, the, the hospital, Bedlam, was moved to a different area. It was actually just around the corner near what is now the Barbican, near Finsbury. And there's a place called Finsbury Circus. And next to that is an area called Moorfields. And Moorfields was where the new incarnation of the hospital would appear. This is what it looked like on an old map. This was an area of field, an area of open space. And it had been used in 1666 in the Great Fire of London. Many people escaping the fire had gathered in Moorfields because the flames couldn't reach them there. If they grabbed people off the streets, who paid for their board? So Lynn, it was often the relatives, the cousins, the nephews, the ones that wanted the money. And they would pay the chief surgeon to pronounce someone insane and then take them off the streets and have them put into these private asylums. And all the while, they would be getting paid for it. The chief surgeon would be paid by these conniving nephews or relatives that wanted the money. So this was Moorfields, and this was the site of the new hospital. This is what it looks like now, Finsbury Circus. Very green and leafy place, very prestigious. And so an equally prestigious asylum was built to contain the new inmates of Bedlam. And this is what it looked like. And as you can see, it looks like a palace. It looks like some French Rococo palace, like Buckingham Palace. And there's a reason for that. You see, this was a new purpose-built asylum and it could house up to 400 inmates. So you can imagine the amount of money that would be generated by something like this. But unfortunately, it wasn't popular with everyone. It certainly pro wasn't pro popular with the French king, Louis XIV, because whether by accident or design, 
This new insane asylum had been built exactly to resemble a palace that Louis XIV already owned in France. And I'll show you. This is the Tuileries of Louis XIV. And this looked almost exactly like the new insane asylum. I think our relations with France weren't particularly good at the time, and that's why they did it. A kind of two fingers up to Louis XIV. He wasn't very pleased <laughs> that his, his favourite palace had been made to look like an, an insane asylum. But you might have thought with this grandiose palace that the conditions of the inmates would get better. But that wasn't the case. In fact, they got worse. On the front of this amazing building, there were two statues. And these two statues are also on the latest incarnation of Bethlehem Royal Hospital. And they represent the two main strands of madness as they were seen at the time. On the left, you can see melancholia. The figure is lying despondent, not doing anything, staring off into the distance. And on the other side, on the right, is mania. The one in chains, struggling to get out, struggling to escape whatever is going on in his disturbed mind. So these were two of the main branches of madness as they were seen at the time. But lunacy applied to lots of different things. One of the things that they did differently was allowed public entry on a grand scale. And you can see that taking place here. They allowed the public to come and watch the lunatics. They would pay a small amount of money. They would uh, be allowed into the asylum and they could watch the lunatics in their, their distress and make fun of them. And that's what they did. It became a spectator sport. As you can see here, the hospital for lunatics and people paying for the privilege of coming to see them. There were also other indiscretions that went on. Some of them would pay extra to go to the women's quarters and be left alone in a cell with disturbed individuals. And there was all sorts of abuse, as you can imagine, that went on. But despite that, the public line was that this new version of Bedlam was really quite good. In fact, they put out a poem supposed to have been written by one of the inmates, a little rhyme that showed how good things were. Our meat is good, the bread and cheese the same, our butter, beer and spoon mean, none can blame. The physic's mild, the vomits are not such, but thanks be praised of these we have no much. Bleeding is wholesome, and for the cold bath, all are agreed it many virtues hath. The beds and bedding are both warm and clean, which to each comer may be plainly seen, except those rooms where the most wild do lie. There all is torn and littered like hogsties. So this was meant to have been written by one of the inmates, and this was put out to show that things really weren't that bad at the, the new hospital. But lunacy, of course, had many different conditions attached to it. And at the time, being a lunatic could mean all sorts of different things. You could be epileptic, you could have melancholia, you could be bipolar, anxiety, autism, delusional, dementia, disability, pregnant, unmarried, a woman. You know, there were many, many ways that you could get a, a, a diagnosis of lunacy at the time. Exactly, Sarah, like when people visited the Elephant Man, a, a real freak show at the time. And But for all of these different diagnoses, all of these, these various stages of lunacy, the treatment was still the same as it had been hundreds of years ago. 
and it was a real freak show. You can see A Visit to Bedlam, another satire here by Thomas Rowlandson. And these are some of the comments of the people that visited. And one of them was Charles Dickens. Though a boy, I was not altogether insensible of the misery of the poor captives, nor destitute of feeling for them. But the madness of some of them had such a humorous air and displayed itself in so many whimsical freaks that it was impossible not to be entertained at the same time that I was angry with myself for being so. To those who have feeling minds, there is nothing so affecting as sights like these, nor can a better lesson be taught us in any part of the globe than in this school of misery. But I am sorry to say it, curiosity and wantonness, more than a desire for instruction, carry the majority of spectators to this dismal place. But those are fallen yet lower, who resort to a hospital intended for the reception and cure of unhappy lunatics, purely to mock at the nakedness of human nature and make themselves merry with the extravagancies of the deface circumstances, the image of the creator, and exhibit their fellow creatures in circumstances of the most pitiable infirmity, debility and unhappiness. So this was the public mood at the time, that lunacy was something that you could go and laugh at, that you could go and watch the antics of the lunatics in the asylum. One of the most infamous things that happened at Bedlam was a dynasty of chief surgeons. And this began with James Monroe, as you can see here. In 1728, he took over as the chief surgeon. He was a member of the Royal College of Surgeons, an esteemed surgeon at the time. You'll notice he wasn't a psychiatrist. There was no such thing at the time. There were mentalists, but the mentalists were not widely regarded. He was a man who <clears throat> understood, in some respect, physical ailments, but not mental ones. And so, as you can imagine, the treatments that James Monroe prescribed were the same ones that had been used centuries before. Like this one, bloodletting. The idea of collecting a little cup or pool of blood on a regular basis to get rid of the sanguine humours in the body. The idea of the apothecary's jar full of strange ingredients, many of which would lead to death especially the many emetics that were prescribed. The idea was that you could vomit out the illness, the lunacy, if you were given the right medicine. And you can see that happening here. Here's someone being prescribed an emetic by their physician, by their quack. And the idea was that you would just not be able to keep your food down. Imagine having norovirus for a week. That was the idea. You would eventually vomit out the badness. So that was James Monroe. <clears throat> and what James Monroe also believed very strongly was that Bedlam... Oh, sorry, Lois, what's an emetic? So an emetic is a medicine that makes you sick, that forces you to vomit. A bit like sticking your fingers down your throat, which is never a nice thing to do. But an emetic would make you immediately vomit uncontrollably. So what James Monroe also believed was that people should pay for their way at Bedlam. And many of the richer patients had already been doing that, but now he extended that to the middle classes. And the working classes, the ones that couldn't afford to pay, were often left to starve to death. And you can see that in this picture on the left-hand side poor family, all of them committed to one of these psychiatric places at the time, being left to starve. 
And in 1735, one man would chronicle some of these injustices. And like Charles Dickens, he would be one of the great social campaigners of his time. But he didn't do it through words, he did it through pictures. His name was William Hogarth. And he painted a series of pictures and drew a series of pictures that would be also seen as, as kind of allegories of the social situation at the time. And this one was one of his most famous. This was called The Rake's Progress. And it tells a chilling story. And it was a story that was all too familiar at the beginning of the 18th century. The story begins with a well-off man who's living at home with his parents. His father dies and leaves him his fortune. But he spends it all on women and gambling. He spends his money unwisely. He begins to, sleep, he begins to wander around the city giving all his money to prostitutes, as you can see here. And eventually, he's divorced by his wife. He's arrested, arrested for non-payment of bills. And that was something that you could be sent to prison for and even hanged for. But eventually, after his arrest, he remarries. But it seems he can't keep out of his old life. He goes back to his old ways and he ends up going to the gaming house to gamble and he gambles away the rest of his fortune and loses his wife at the same time. He then ends up in the prison and the prison is not the last stop for him because having lost everything he owns at the prison, having been forced to pay his way there, he then loses his mind and ends up in the madhouse. And that was all too common a story for many people in the 18th century, this descent into poverty and madness. Oh. And here's a, a blow up, a, a larger version of that last panel where the, the rake this unfortunate person has been committed to Bedlam. And William Hogarth wanted to tell a real story here. So you can see the poor rake there on the, the left-hand side. He's had his head shaved. He's lost his wits completely. But what Hogarth wanted to do was to show that it wasn't just poor people that ended up in asylums like this. You also had famous musicians that could end up here. You had scientists that might also end up in an asylum. You had members of the church, members of the clergy that could also be declared mad at a moment's notice. And you also had the ladies that would come and visit them and that would stand and watch the antics of the lunatics. And just to make the point absolutely clear, William Hogarth drew the picture of a coin, a British coin, on the wall. And what he was trying to do was to give people the idea this was happening in their own country. This injustice was going on right under their nose. But eventually, James Monroe left. He retired from being the, the, the chief surgeon of Bedlam. In 1752, he retired. And luckily, he had someone lined up for the job. Someone he thought that would make the new perfect surgeon for the Bedlam Hospital. And this was <clears throat> John Monroe. Like father, like son. John Monroe was cut from exactly the same cloth as his father. And he believed in the same regimens, the same punishments, the same... Uh, routines. In fact, he even added a few of his own. One thing that he added to the list of gory and gruesome treatments that took place at Bedlam was this idea of being swung around in a chair. And the, the lunatic is placed in the chair and swung violently around the room. The idea was to disorient, disorient them so much that they lost their madness along the way. 
kind of cancelling out the madness by disorientating them so much. And of course, he was a firm believer in his father's regimen of cold baths. So nothing really changed under the reign of John Munro. In fact, things got worse at Bedlam than they were before. But not everyone agreed with these ideas. There was a, a vicar, a county doctor, and called Lewis Southcombe, and he wrote this in 1753. Showing the distinction between a wounded conscience convicted by a sense of sin and a wounded spirit proceeding from a disordered body, proving that the latter is more grievous than the former and comes not under the denomination of conscience, but of disease to which all mankind are liable, and that in either case the miserably afflicted are neither mad nor out of their senses, but only that their animal spirits are either elated, confused and hurried, or otherwise oppressed and dejected, showing that all severities and confinement are prejudicial, as are all endeavours that give pain or sink the spirits, and that in the former case nothing can relieve them but divines, and the latter nothing but the judicious physician and apothecaries that will be true both to the physician and to the patients. Exactly, Dawn. They were torture specialists. And Louis Southcombe was one of a growing number of doctors who disagreed with them and said that these people had problems of the mind, not of the body, and that punishing the body could certainly not in any way improve the state of the mind. But still, these punishments would continue. You can see some of the contraptions that were invented, many of them in Bedlam, including close confinement. If the patient was out of their comfort zone, if they were wandering around and uh, out of control, they could be confined in these kind of open coffins and kept there until they had calmed down, which of course they would eventually. Did King George? Well, Michael, there's a good story. The madness of King George. If you've never watched the film, which stars Nigel Hawthorne, a brilliant depiction of George the, the Third, then you should go and see it, uh, or should find it somewhere and watch it, because it tells the story of King George. And even kings were not immune to this kind of quackery. So he was pronounced insane probably at the plot of the Prince Regent, George IV, his horrible son. And he was taken to what amounted to a private asylum for several months. He eventually recovered his wits. But yes, you're right. He did go mad, the madness of King George. What we think now is that it was porphyria, which is a genetic disease, caused him to go blind for a while, to go deaf, to lose his senses. And we think it was a genetic disease which afflicted many royal families of the time. So one of the people that disagreed with this diagnosis of madness being cured by physical pain was this man, William Batty. And William Batty had worked at Bedlam himself, so he knew what things were like. He'd worked as the assistant surgeon, but he disagreed with the Monroe dynasty. And he made his disagreement very clear. He was a member of the Royal College of Surgeons as well, so he had some clout. And this is what he wrote. Although frequently taken for one species of disorder, nevertheless, when thoroughly examined, it discovers as much variety with respect to its causes and circumstances as any distemper whatever. Madness, therefore, like most other morbid cases, rejects all general methods, e.g. bleeding, blisters, caustics, rough cathartics, the gums and fetid antihysterics, opium, mineral waters, cold baths and vomits. 
So what William Batty did was systematically destroy all of the remedies that the Monroe dynasty were prescribing. He was saying that all of these, uh, these, these cures were bound to fail because they were not, not, not kind of moral. And John Monroe answered him. <clears throat> Having been attacked personally, he wrote his own reply. I will venture to say that the most adequate and constant cure is by evacuation, which can alone be determined by the constitution of the patient and the judgment of the physician. I never saw or heard of the bad effects of vomits in my practice. Nor can I suppose any mischief to happen but from their being injudiciously administered or when they are given too strong or the person who orders them is too much afraid of the lancet. So that was John Munro saying, actually, you know, vomiting is good. Vomiting has worked for many of my patients. They've not killed themselves. So he was a strong believer that his methods were working. And because he was the head of Bedlam, most of the medical fraternity agreed with him. But William Batty went further. He decided to get together with a group of stockholders and open a new hospital, St Luke's, just across the road from Bedlam. Persons afflicted with other diseases are admitted without delay into one or other of our hospitals. But persons afflicted with this worst of all diseases are not admitted into any hospital but Bethlehem, probably on account of the safety of the other patients, a small limited number into Mr Guy's only accepted. Would it not, therefore, be a most useful and necessary charity to establish a hospital where such unhappy persons may be immediately admitted and have the proper means of care early administered to them, which are found most effectual when the patients are under the management of strangers and by which fatal accidents may be prevented. If we may judge of the probability of success in this undertaking by the great spirit of charity and generosity that has lately attended the setting on foot of some other hospitals, it may be fairly concluded that whenever a proper scheme for this purpose is offered to the public, it will meet with suitable encouragement. So this was his affidavit, if you like, that he put out to many of the rich people of London, asking them to fund him in the building of a new hospital. And this became St Luke's. And it was right opposite Bedlam, a poke in the eye for John Munro. And it was also designed very differently. As you can see here, it resembles an old Victorian hospital or even a prison. And that's because it was designed by a man called George Dance, who designed prisons at the time. He designed one of the versions of Newgate Prison. So it was meant to look big and imposing. And the idea was that it certainly wasn't to look like somewhere that the public could go freely. No more people coming in to watch the lunatics. And they would be kept safe. They would be kept secure away from the public so that they could be treated properly. So this was St Luke's and it was a brilliant idea and it became very successful in its own right. But at the same time, the madhouses were still in operation. The private madhouses set up by the chief surgeons of people, places like Bedlam. And there were still these stories circulating about the conditions there. Ten days in the madhouse. So eventually, they made a new law. Parliament made a new law that put a cap on these night on these madhouses that said that the madhouses were not legal anymore. And this put people like John Monroe out of business. No more could they send off rich clients to these places in the country. But Bedlam still had 
a reputation to uphold. And part of it was because it took on some very high-profile clients, like this lady, Margaret Nicholson, who was accused of trying to kill the king, George III at the time. She had been waiting for him after a public engagement and had walked out and tried to stab him, as you can see in the picture on the left. And at the trial, John Monroe was the one who declared her insane and had her brought to Bedlam. So she was a high-profile client and she kept the reputation of Bedlam going strong. But in 1792, <clears throat> things would change again. John Monroe and William Batty would be replaced. And they were replaced by Thomas Monroe. <clears throat> oh dear, plus ça change, plus ça même chose. The more things change, the more they stay the same. It was another of the Monroe dynasty that would take over as the new chief surgeon. But luckily, this Monroe was a bit more forward-thinking than his predecessors. He had different ideas, ideas more aligned to William Batty, the idea of treating the patients nicely instead of beating them and making them vomit. And he was assisted by an apothecary called John Haslam, who also had what at the time were quite radical ideas about treating patients with respect and finding out what was wrong with their brains, not their bodies. So this would mark a real change. But by that time, in many people's eyes, it was too late. The, the Moorfields Hospital had grown into disrepair, and it had become a morbid and awful place. A strange sense of utter desertion came over you. Long, gloomy lines of cells, strongly barred and obscured with the accumulated dust, silent as the grave, unless fancy, fancy brought sounds of woe to your ears, rose before you. And there, on each side of the principal entrance, were the wonderful effigies of raving and moping madness, chiselled by the elder Kibber. How these stone faces and eyes glared! How sternly the razor must have swept over their heads. How listless and dead were those limbs, bound with inexorable fetters, while the iron of despair had pierced the hearts of the prisoned maniacs. So things inside the building hadn't changed enough by that point. It was still a gloomy and depressing place. But in 1815... It would move again. Due to the increasing pressure on land prices at the time, Bedlam would be uprooted and moved to the south side of the river, to an area near Southwark. This is the Southwark Cross, and this is very near to the area where the new hospital would eventually be built. And the new hospital would take on its own celebrity clients. People like this man, James Tilly Matthews. And James Tilly Matthews would become the subject of a treatise by John Haslam, the apothecary and assistant surgeon. He wrote a book about this very peculiar maniac, this unique maniac that had come into his asylum. The story is James Tilly Matthews, as you can see on the right, had been part of the French Revolution. In fact, he'd been a spy for the British, or that's what the French thought. They had him arrested, thrown into the Bastille, and he was nearly executed. He was then sent back in disgrace to England. Now, the book that you can see on the left was written by John Haslam, and it's about the nature of assailment the bomb-bursting, lobster-cracking and lengthening of the brain. These were all things that James Tilly Matthews claimed to be suffering from. When he got back to England, James Tilly Matthews stood up in the House of Commons. Hey, hey, there's my parliamentary reference. Stood up in the House of Commons and accused the Prime Minister of being a French spy. Now, rather than being sentenced to prison or accused of treason, 
both of which were real possibilities, he was instead sent to Bedlam. And in Bedlam, he began to describe his particular paranoid ideas. And he drew them as well. He was an expert draftsman. And this is a drawing of what James Tilly Matthews believed was happening in Europe at the time. This was a machine that was meant to be called the heirloom and it was transmitting invisible rays that were controlling people all over Europe. There was some shadowy organisation, a bit like Smirch in the James Bond films, that was controlling people via the use of this heirloom, including James Tilly Matthews. And that's what this bomb-bursting, lobster-cracking and lengthening, lengthening the brain was all about. These were the, the things that were meant to happen to you when you were exposed to this invisible ray. This was clearly tinfoil hat territory. But it was a, an interesting case study for John Haslam, and it made him quite famous when he published this report on John Tilly Matthews' condition. In fact, you can see a replica, and this is in Scotland, in Edinburgh, I believe, in a little museum. Someone has designed a working, probably not completely working, replica of James Tilly Matthews' heirloom. James Tilly Matthews was an extraordinary patient, and he would prove it. When the plans were being laid up for the new hospital... This was his design. That's OK, Michelle. Thank you very much for coming. So he came up with a new design for the hospital itself. And this was it. This was the site of the new Bedlam. And it would become something completely different. After it had finished being Bedlam in the 1960s, it was turned into the National Army Museum, as you can see here, the War Museum. And it was run by Thomas Monroe for a while, but eventually he was taken over by Edward Wakefield. Edward Wakefield was even more progressive than John Haslam had been before him, and he came up with some radical new approaches to the treatment of patients. So he got rid of Thomas Monroe and John Haslam and he employed Edward Thomas Monroe. Yep, another one of the Monroe clan. But Edward Thomas Monroe was employed as his assistant, not the chief surgeon, and was a follower of Edward Wakefield's ideas. He also employed George Tuthill as the, the apothecary at the asylum. And together, the three of them actually reinvented the whole asylum. They made it nice. They put plants in. They made it comfortable. They put carpets in. They made it a nice place for people to be. A nice, comforting, calm environment. And this, of course, had an immediate effect on the well-being of the patients that went there. And you could see that in the letters that were written. This was an anonymous letter, Sketches in Bedlam, that was written some years after the changes were put into progress. Too much praise cannot be conferred on Dr Monroe for his humane attention and the kind feeling he at all times evinces for the unhappy persons under his care. At every visit, he orders all his patients to be brought regularly together. When he counts them, examines them one after another and inquires of the keeper every particular relating to each, even to the most trivial circumstance. Nor is less commendation due to the meritorious conduct of Sir George Tuthill, whose gentlemanly, kind and humane intentions are ministered with unwearied diligence and in some cases with the most invincible patience or he could not bear the abusive insolence of many refractory subjects. So this was by a constant observer, someone who wished to remain anonymous. But it showed how things were now changing in the modern bedlam. 
And for the next 50 years, Bedlam would continue to operate. And it would take patients, many of whom their photographs we now have, and they would be treated properly with care, respect and dignity, certainly more than they had back in the dark past of the 19th century. And eventually, there was another act in 1845. The State of Lunacy Act gave legal provision for the insane. So that meant that there was a legal reason for them to be sent to these places. And the lunacy law was also introduced. And that banned the private madhouses and it cleaned up the the behaviour and the, the administration in the insane asylums. They were regularly monitored by government. And in 1930, this was the last incarnation of Bedlam. And this is in the south of London, near Croydon. And it's open to the public. It's also a day centre for people with mental health issues and one of the leading places of its type. But it's also a museum, a museum of the mind, you might say. And right at the entrance to this museum, you the same two figures that used to adorn the top of the old asylum, melancholy and mania. So things have now come full circle and Bedlam is now a world-class mental health institution. But, as Francis Farmer says, never console yourself into believing that the terror has passed, for it looms as large and evil today as it did in the despicable era of Bedlam. But I must relate the horrors as I recall them, in the hope that some force for mankind might be moved to relieve forever the unfortunate creatures who are still imprisoned in the back wards of decaying institutions. So things are changing, but for many people, they're not changing quickly enough. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much for listening. I hope that you've, well not enjoyed, but I hope that you've found it interesting and, and informative rather than just enjoying it. Thank you all very much for coming. Again, I've posted a link where you can tip me on PayPal, buy me a coffee and all of those things. Lovely to see you all. And I will be doing many more tours in the coming weeks. I'll be taking you out and about on the trail of William Wallace, the Scottish independence fighter. Mel Gibson will not be in attendance, I promise. Telling this true story of the, the revolutionary Scottish hero and his gruesome execution, which is what I like. I like a bit of gruesome execution. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you for your lovely comments. And I look forward to seeing you on a happier topic, possibly very soon. Thank you and good night.